First Kings 17, verse 21. We're going to skip a lot of First and Second Kings just because I'm going to cherry pick a few things out of Kings to talk about. And then we'll go back through First and Second Kings, focusing on the kings themselves. Um, the, when you see that divided kingdom, and who's ruling at what time, and who's the counterpart, and how are they taking over, and uh, what, what king royal family is in charge and which one is not. Now the southern kingdom, Judah, is all run by one royal family, the family of David. The northern has about five of them that take over back and forth, and you'll see how they change hands and all that stuff. But we'll go through in detail on that. But for now, we're just going to go through and get the fun stuff. We're going to have ice cream before we have our meal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First Kings 17, verse 21. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O my Lord God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come, again, uh, come into him again. This is Elijah healing a, a child that's been sick or is supposed to be dead now. So this tells you something. It doesn't tell you a whole lot, but it tells you something. That the soul is the real child. The soul is the real him. Otherwise, you've just got a dead body lying there. He said something's missing from this body to give it life. And that's the soul. The soul is the real you. And you can follow that all the way through your Bible. There's a little difference in the soul in the Old Testament and in the New Testament for a Christian. For a Christian, God cuts the soul loose from the flesh. In the Old Testament, when you're alive, the flesh is connected to the soul. So if a man touched something, he says if a soul touch anything unclean, he's unclean till even. Well, your soul is inside you. How can it touch anything? Well, the flesh touches it. So it, the flesh can contaminate the soul. However, in the New Testament, we get what's called the circumcision made without hands. So Jesus Christ, after Jesus Christ came, we're put in him, he cuts free the flesh from the soul. So now that's what makes the difference between the whole list of bad things that Paul says. Some of you were, you know, a murderer, a, a fornicator, an adulterer, you know, all those, that long list, but now are you washed? So he says some of you were, but now you're not. But you could still commit those things. But it's the flesh that commits them, not the soul. The soul's been cut free, and it doesn't con it's not contaminated by what the flesh does. So, a saved person can do the very same sins an unsaved person can. But he's never defined by that action, because it's the, the flesh that does it. The spirit and the soul are not doing it. They're saved. Um, so that's the difference. Uh, and then we'll go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 26. We're going to look at two passages, Matthew 16, 26 and Luke 9, 25. Matthew 16, 26 and Luke 9, 25. This is two good verses to know to explain the soul. Matthew uh, 16, 26, and Luke 9, 25. If you compare these verses, I like to do this. I like to compare and contrast verses and see where wording changes. When wording changes, it's defining the other one. In Matthew 16, 26, he says, What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So where your soul that's in your body if you lose that even though you've gained the whole world what's it profit you or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul in Luke he's going to tell us the same thing with a little different wording Luke 9 25 Luke 9 25 what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away the you, the identity of who you are, is the soul. So that's why Elijah is asking for the soul to return into that body. First Kings 18.32 I found another one. 
Actually, I'll give you another one that's fun. Um, look at um, look at Mark uh, twelve. Mark twelve, um, and I'll have to find it. No, it wasn't Mark 12. It's uh, Matthew 28, I think, or Matthew 23. Um, I am very prepared. Look at this. Maybe I didn't write it down. Let's do this. You'll, we'll be back to Matthew, but turn to Psalms 8. I know where the cross-reference is. Psalms 8, verse 2. Psalms 8. Verse 2. Okay, see what it says there. Psalms 8, verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained, what? Strength, because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemies and the avenger. Okay, so out of babies, God has ordained strength. Let's find Jesus quote this verse. He'll quote it in Matthew twenty one sixteen. Matthew 21, 16. I thought I added the note here, but I don't see my note. It's not there. I don't know what happened to it. Okay. Matthew 21, 16. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto him, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? Okay, that's the way that we read it in Psalms. Hast thou, what did it say in Psalms? Ordained. What does it say here? Perfected. Okay, so that gives you a definition of ordained. When Jesus said, I've ordained you, he perfected them for their mission. They were perfect for that mission. He says, out of the mouth of babes hast thou perfected, not strength. Here he says, praise. Praise. So in God's eyes, when you're praising him, that's when you're strong. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's just by comparing the very same verse. One spoken by Jesus Christ, one spoken by David. Very same thing. And you can see he'll change up just a little wording here or a little wording there to define it. So you know exactly what he's talking about. All right, let's go back to the lesson. Uh, 1 Kings 18.32. Now Elijah is going to face the prophets of Baal. And to do this, there's going to be a big show. He says, y'all go ahead and build you an altar, do whatever y'all do, and I'll build one too, and we'll have a competition. So here he is. 1 Kings 18, verse 32. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. So we know the story. He's going to pour water on it and he's going to fill up the trench. And what ends up happening is fire comes down from heaven, consumes the offering and the water. But notice what he did. He built a trench around it 
and he tells you something specific about that trench. As much as would contain two measures of seed. Now that's a weird thing to say. But it's two measures of seed, not one. So let's find out what a measure of seed is. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 18. Two measures, not just one measure. Two measures on purpose. Matthew 13, verse 18. Here, therefore, a parable of the sower. So this is going to be the parable of the sower and the seed. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. So that's the seed. The seed is the word of the kingdom. Okay, that's one definition of the seed. But he said two measures of seed. Well, it makes sense because there's two kingdoms. Kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. And that's how the Bible defines the seed. That's Matthew 13, 18 to 23. Um, and then we'll find another definition of it in Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, verse 11. Two measures of seed. The seed is either the word of the kingdom or this. Luke 8, verse 11. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Well, we don't have two Bibles, do we? But we've got an Old Testament and a New Testament. Two measures of seed. So that's why he filled up the trough with two measures of seed. This is of God. And most people miss the two kingdoms. But that's how Jesus first identifies it in the New Testament. The kingdom, the word of the kingdom, is the seed. Back to 1 Kings, 1 Kings 19.15. 1 Kings 19.15. And, uh, yes. This is Elijah at the end of his life. He's being told a mission. God gives him a mission of something he's supposed to do. And that's the prophet's job. Was he, was, he was to send a message or he was to do something specific that God gave him instruction for. And here it is, verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou art come, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Saphath, of Abel-Meholah, huh, that place, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Okay, so what did he tell him to do? Three things. Of those three things, we'll see that he doesn't do them. Of those three things, the first thing he's told to do is go anoint. What's anoint? We just learned that one. Perfected. Perfect. Anoint. So there's someone perfect for the job. In our verse 15, who is it? Haziel. The king of what? Syria. Since when does, does a Jew anoint another nation's king? Yeah, another nation, all together. God's doing it on purpose because that king of that nation is going to do something that has to do with his people. And he says, this king over here will be perfect for this job I have for him. You'll find it again um, when, um, who is it um, in Ezra, the first king that shows up, Cyrus. Cyrus is anointed of God. God calls him his servant, his anointed. Okay, well, that's a pagan king. But he's perfect for the mission God has him for. That's the same thing here. Okay, the first thing Elijah needs to do is go anoint a pagan king to be king. Well, that's just weird. I'm sorry, that's just weird. <laughs> 
Verse 16, second mission. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. Now you'd expect that. The Israel he's talking about here is the ten northern kingdoms, or the ten northern tribes. Uh, this is after the split in Israel. And Elisha, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. So Elisha is going to take over for him. That's in his room means you'll no longer be around. He can have your room now. <laughs> That's when, the, when, when there's several kids in the family, the, the best room is usually given to the oldest. And then you're waiting for that one to move out to get their room. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work in our house. <laughs> They all get the couch. No. Uh, <laughs> okay, so Elijah only does two-thirds of his mission. No, he fails two-thirds. He only does one-third. In first, uh, 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 13, let's see what happens. 2 Kings 8, 13. Second Kings 8, 13. And Haziel said, But what is thy servant a dog that he should do this great thing? And Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha answered, The Lord hath showed me thou shalt be king over Syria. He didn't know it. That means Elijah didn't tell him. Okay. So now Elisha's got to do it because Elijah left that one undone. Go to the next chapter, chapter 9, verse 2. 2 Kings 9, 2. And when thou comest thither, look out there Jehu, the son of... Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him arise up from among his brethren and carry him to an inner chamber. Elisha anoints Jehu after Elijah's gone. Haziel's informed by Elisha of his future kingship. So Elijah didn't do what he was told to do. But he did do one thing. He anointed his replacement. He said, oh, time, time to clock out? If I do this one job, I can clock out? <laughs> okay, let me get right to that one. It's like if I gave a list and said, you need to do this, 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 and this, and when this is finished, you can clock out. Then you just go straight to the, the final one and do it and clock out. <laughs> That's what he did. Um, Look at Second Kings eight. Uh, no, we already we already covered that. The word Hazel occurs twenty three times in twenty one verses. Um, Hazel has been anointed for a reason. He's appointed an instrument of destruction. God intends him to destroy someone he doesn't like, and it's his own people. Of all the things, look at Psalms. 89 verse 30. Psalms 89 verse 30. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then I will visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. That's exactly what Hazel's being anointed to do. He's the enforcer of God's rules. Israel as a nation has not been following what God told them to do. You see, they're setting up their own form of religion. They're worshiping Baal. They're worshiping bulls that they've made. God says, I'm not going to put up with that. And I've already told them, if they depart, I'm going to beat them within an inch of their life, and some of them their whole life. And 2 Samuel 7, verse 14. 2 Samuel 7, verse 14. This is what God told uh, David concerning Solomon. 2 Samuel 7, 14. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod, here it is, of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. God uses humans 
to be his spanking stick. <laughs> and that's what he's going to do with this nation. Look at it in 2 Kings 10, verse 32. Second Kings 10.32 says, In those days the Lord began to cut Israel short. <laughs> He's whittling them down. And Haziel smote them in all the coasts of Israel. Okay, God's doing it. How's he doing it? Haziel. Haziel's taking care of business. But God says, it's really me doing it. Look at it in uh, chapter 12, 2 Kings 12, 17. And Haziel, king of Syria, went up uh, and fought against Gath and took it. And Haziel set his face to go uh, up to... What did, where did I tell y'all? Um, okay, good. We're in the same verse. <laughs> uh, he set his face to go up to Jerusalem. You know where Jerusalem is? That's the capital of not the ten northern tribes, of Judah, down here. So this guy is taken over. I mean, he's, he's the predecessor to um, any of the greats that have tried to take over the world, like Hitler and Pharaoh and all the rest of them. Look at it in chapter... Um, 13 verse 22 2nd Kings 13 22 2nd Kings 13 22 but Haziel king of Syria oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz okay so he doesn't let up on it this is his mission and this is his life goal and he doesn't quit it so no wonder he's been anointed of God God says okay they need correcting and I know somebody who will do it. We're going to go anoint a heathen king to be king just because I got a job for him to do. And that's what he did. Now, let's look at it on the map. You know where Syria is. Syria is not on this map, I don't think. Um, it'll be up here. Damascus is um, should be right about here. That's where Damascus in Syria is. And David at one time had captured Syria, or Damascus. He calls it his border in Damascus. Now, I'm going to show you where Gath is. Gath is right here. You see how far down he's come? He's taken all of Israel. And then he's going to come over here to Jerusalem. He's cleaning up shop. This is no pushover. When God anoints a destruction from somebody else, they do what he says. And he's not playing around. Jehu. Jehu's got a mission. In um, 2 Chronicles 22, Jehu's been anointed to be the king of Israel, the ten northern tribes, for a reason. He's going to be the instrument of destruction for the house of Ahab. Ahab was a bad dude, and God is going to let him have it. Second Chronicles 22, 7. And the destruction of Ahaz was of God by coming to Joram. For when he was come, he went out with Joram against Jehu, the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had anointed to cut off the house of Ahab. God said, I anointed him for a reason. The reason is he's going to get rid of this king, who's not doing anything according to what I've said. In 2 Kings 10, in 2 Kings 10, 1 to 6, I don't know that I've got time to read it all, but there you'll find out, in fact, 70 sons of Ahab are destroyed by Jehu because he's anointed to do a job. And he does it. Elisha is anointed. Why? He's supposed to be a prophet. So he's going to be the mouthpiece for God. Now that one Elijah did do. Elijah anointed him like he was supposed to. But the anointing was 
on purpose because God had decided this guy is going to be perfect for what I need. And he was. We'll cover it at some point. I'll show you the list of miracles that are done by Elijah versus Elisha. Elisha does twice as many. Okay. He's anointed, and he really does it, and God knows what he's doing when he does the anointing. <laughs> he did, yep. Mm -hmm. Well, he asked for a double portion of his, his, uh, his spirit, yeah. Um, but that didn't necessarily mean he would get a double amount of miracles. But um, he did. He did, a, he did double duty. Um, and you can just write these references down. I'm not going to cover them on Elisha. It's obvious that Elisha is anointed by God to be a prophet. In 2 Kings 2, 23 to 24, Isaiah 11, verse 4. Hosea 6, 5, Revelation 19, 21, and Revelation 1, 16. Those will all talk about the job of a prophet, and his job was to be a mouthpiece, to open his mouth and tell people what God had to say, and it wasn't something they wanted to hear. <laughs> so he had to anoint somebody specific because there wasn't a whole bunch of people lining up for the job. <laughs> Look at uh, 1 Kings 19, verse 20. 1 Kings 19.20. Here's Elijah. He's going to anoint Elisha. Now, Elisha has a rough start, but he has a real good finish. And usually it happens that way. I don't know why, but usually if they have a good start, you see them have a horrible ending. And if they have a rough start, usually they've figured it out. They've been beat up enough that they finish well. And Elisha here has a bad start. He just about does not get anointed because of the way he acts. You find the same thing with Saul. Saul starts good. He's humble. He doesn't want to be king. He doesn't want the limelight. David starts good. Uh, they all start good and end bad. When they start bad, it seems like they end good. <laughs> First Kings 19 verse 20. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I to do with thee? What has happened is Elisha has come in. Eli El i got to get this straight. Elijah has come through. Elisha is out there plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. And Elijah throws his mantle over his shoulder, telling him, okay, you're going to come follow me. And, and then Elisha says, hey, that sounds like a great idea. However, I've got a few things I need to get done first. I've got a couple of chores I'm going to handle. And the response from Elijah is, take off, buddy. I've got nothing to do with you. So the responsibility of discipleship depends on the response of the student not the teacher. Elijah had done the part he was supposed to. He went to find Elisha. But then when Elisha didn't snap to it right away, it's off of his to-do list. He did the part he was supposed to do. We have to do that. But you know, you've got to be sensitive to it. You can't baby somebody forever. You can't. At some point, they've got to decide they're going to stand up and do what the, the right thing is, or else you'll just waste all your time trying to train somebody who doesn't want to be trained. So that was Elijah. He says, look, if you're not the right one, I'm not wasting my time. Let's find it in the Bible in several places. Luke 9, verse 61. Luke 9, verse 61. Jesus makes reference to this very event in Luke 9. Luke 9, verse 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at, my, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Okay, so he says, look, if you're going to be double-minded about this, then I've got no use for you. 
in Proverbs 24, 21. Proverbs 24, 21. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. It tells you the smart thing to do without having to learn it by failure. <laughs> you, can, you can learn it from other people's failure. He says here, Proverbs 24, 21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. So don't mess with Obama. Vote for change. No. <laughs> he said, meddle not with them that are given to change. So if you see someone who's wishy-washy, there's always changing. He says, don't mess with the, those type people. They're given to change. You'll think you're heading one way, and then all of a sudden it'll change on you. You'll think one thing and be on track with it, and then before you know it, they'll have done a 360, and you're heading you don't know where. Don't mess with those type people. In Acts 15, 38, Paul finds the same thing. On his second missionary journey, he's going to take John Mark along, or uh, not, it's Silas that's going to take him along, and we'll find Paul say, no, sir, I'm not going to meddle with somebody given to change. Acts 15, 38, but Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Somebody that is given to change will change at just the wrong time. When it's really time to work, they suddenly got something better to do. <laughs> That's right. That's right. In Acts uh, 15, verse 17. He says that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom uh, my name is called, saith the Lord, who doth these things. Okay, so the mission is that important. All the Gentiles is their mission. It's a big job. So Paul says, look, if we're going to take somebody with us, let's make sure it's somebody who can handle the amount of work we got to do. Paul, <laughs> you look at the way Paul talks, and it's like, how in the world did he actually think he could accomplish all those things he wanted to do? He says, I'm going to go preach the gospel to people who've never heard it. Well, that was fairly easy back then because it was new. However, you see the territory he covers. He says, we went into this country and I ran out of places I could preach it. Everybody's heard. I'm going to go find another one. And that's what he does. He says, I won't build on another man's work. And you look at the map of his three missionary journeys, and he's covering the map. I don't know how he covered the territory he did. Look at James chapter 1, verse 8. James 1, 8. This is an important topic to, to know. Because, not, not only because you'll see it in other people and need to be aware of it, but you'll see it in yourself. Uh, yeah, you'll see it in yourself, and you'll have to tell yourself, hey, Straighten up, boy. <laughs> You'll have to. You, really, you cannot preach to other people very effectively until that sermon has been wore out on yourself. <laughs> and that's the way God seems to work. He'll wear you out with a message before he lets you preach it to somebody else. And then you'll preach it with a little more grace. Because <laughs> you've been there. James 1, verse 8. He says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Okay, that's just a fact. If somebody can't make up their mind, I don't mind if a person takes a long time to make a decision, but once you make a decision, make it. Do it. <laughs> um, here he's saying, a double-minded, okay, I'm going to do that, but I don't know, maybe I won't. Okay, just make a choice. Man up. <laughs> if it's wrong, make the wrong one. Just make it. In Genesis 49, verse 4. Genesis 49, verse 4. I don't have it there. I think we're talking about Reuben. But that's not a sandwich. That's a son of <laughs> Jacob. Yep. Reuben? 
Yeah. Genesis 49, 4. He said, this is how I see this guy. This turkey is double-minded. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Okay, if you're going to excel, don't be so timid about making a decision. Make a decision and go for it. Now, don't just go out willy-nilly making decisions. Try to make the right one, okay? <laughs> Try to make the right one. But there comes a time you've got to do something. And if you'll never make a choice, that's the verse right there. Be unstable and never excel. Sometimes you can excel from failure. That propels you faster. <laughs> okay, I saw that was the wrong decision. We won't do that one again. <laughs> Make a decision. In Numbers 32, 1. Numbers 32, 1. We saw the prophecy. Reuben is unstable as water, and he won't excel. Let's find him come through the wilderness and just about get into Canaan. And then the water kicks in. <laughs> Numbers 32, 1. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, behold, the place was a place for cattle. They didn't go on into Canaan. They didn't take the possession. They said, we'll stay over here on the wrong side. Because we got cattle, and this looks like a good spot for cattle. Forget what God said we were going to get in the land that flows with milk and honey and all that stuff. We got cattle. That's exactly right. Double-minded. He says they were unstable, and sure enough, that's where they are, and they don't excel. They stay on the wrong side of things. Look at it, verse 4. Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. <laughs> well, maybe that's not what they were going to have. Maybe they, they were going to have what he said, houses full of good things that you didn't put in there, things you didn't build, I'll give to you. But no, they wanted to be stuck with the same thing they'd have for 300 years, just cows, sheep, goats. Oh, we like that. I'll trade that in for a house full of goodies any day. <laughs> Judges chapter 5, verse 15. Judges chapter 5, verse 15. Here's Reuben again. Still can't make up his mind. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. He was sent afoot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleeding of the flock? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. When it came time to fight, Reuben wasn't helping anybody. Oh no, we don't have to go over there and fight. I know all our brethren are over here fighting, but we'll stay right over here with our sheep. Act like the sheep are bleating so loud that we can't hear the fighting. <laughs> In Romans chapter 125. Romans 1.25 This is a double-minded man who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Uh, blessed, who is blessed forever. Amen. That's what happens nowadays. They take the truth of God and turn it into a lie that's convenient. That's what you find our problem will be. When you read the Bible, you'll read it trying to make it say what you want it to say. A lot of times it doesn't say what you want it to say. And it'll say something. We got a couple of things that we're working on and can't figure out. You'll find that. You'll find it say something and it'll throw a monkey wrench in everything you've always thought. Okay. Don't twist it into a lie. Be careful. 
Let the Bible be the Bible. God levels heavy curses against that. Let God be God. He says in Malachi 2, verse 2, Malachi 2, verse 2. He says, If you will not hear, if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Okay, don't be double-minded when you read the Bible. <laughs> when he says something, say, yes, sir. Now, that doesn't mean that you just stop at one verse. Find out everything he's got to say on the subject. Because one verse may make it appear that it means one thing, and you've got to get all of them together to see the full picture. But you've got to get it all together. Um, you've got to be careful taking one verse and making a whole doctrine out of it. Making a whole statement out of one verse. Something that's only said once in the Bible. Um, you've got to be careful about making whole doctrines out of things not said in the Bible. For instance, I can say, we know that, um, that, uh, that Jesus' mother was killed by the Apostle John. He shot her with a forty-five. We know that. <laughs> I can say that. I can say, well, it doesn't say she didn't. <laughs> okay, so don't make a doctrine out of things that it doesn't say. Okay, let the Bible just be the Bible. And you'll find people try, now I've used a very extreme example, but you'll find people do the same thing. Well, it doesn't say it, so it must be. Well, no, not necessarily. Let it say exactly what it says, just the way it says it. In 1 Kings 20, verse 42. That's right, yeah. It can just keep going and going. <laughs> How do you know that? The Bible doesn't say they didn't have it. <laughs> First Kings 20, verse 42. This is um, Ben-Hadad, the story of Ben-Hadad. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. <clears throat> Open rebellion against God begs God for destruction. And if you stand in his way, you'll be destroyed with it. God said, I intend Ben-Hadad to be destroyed and his people. And because the king of Israel decided he was going to let him go because Ben-Hadad had promised him a bunch of cities, he said, well, you know, I'll put him into, um, uh, I'll tax him, and he'll be a servant of mine. Well, God didn't intend him to be the servant and be paying the king of Israel. He intended him to be dead, beheaded, <laughs> done. God has enemies, and he wants his enemies dead. And now, when the king of Israel decides to save his life, God says, okay, you've become my enemy. And here... The prophet is going to tell him God's decided his life's over. And this is where you get the prophecy of his death and his wife Jezebel. Um, and we probably better stop it there. We'll pick it up next week at 1 Samuel 21, 25. I, what I'll do is I'll go through uh, 1 and 2 Kings. I said Samuel, but 1 and 2 Kings. And then we'll probably get the PowerPoint up, and I'll go through and show you how the kings come into office and who's reigning and what important story about them. And some of them, there's not much said because some of them only reign, you know, seven days, one month. Uh, it really. And so, you know, there's not a whole lot about that. But we'll go through and we'll find out how they line up. And there's some important things and some th things that we won't understand. I'll just tell you right now, there's some things that won't add up. Numbers. <laughs> We're going to need to know <clears throat> how many years they're reigning 
and we won't know it because we won't have agreement on numbers because nobody was around <laughs> nobody knows what year it was really so everybody has ideas of what year they think this happened and that happened and they're just guesswork so I don't get real hung up on what year this happened or what year that happened we'll just take round numbers and about this year or about that year and um, when God says something took exactly 70 years then we say it took exactly 70 years I don't care what it looks like the math is adding up to God said it was 70 years it's 70 years okay so let's just err that way <laughs> so we'll go through the kings and not worry about when numbers don't look like they're adding up all right we'll call it yes probably two weeks from now <laughs>